Prepare yourselves for a splunking expedition through the ancient caves of Fortran 4, the PDP-10, and the original Colossal Cave Adventure game. Please welcome Chris to the stage. Uh, thank you. Um, so again, my name is Christopher Swenson. Uh, I have my Twitter handle and my GitHub on every slide, so hopefully uh, that, and I've just published the slides on GitHub as well, so you can feel free to follow along or look later. Um, like he said, uh, this talk is just going to be about the original Colossal Cave Adventure, um, as well as sort of weird details on PDP-10 and Fortran 4, and I'll get to all that. Um, audience for this talk is basically people who are here, people who are curious about this sort of thing and are a bit programmery. Um, you know, this, this talk is mostly in Fortran 4 with some Python, so it's not like anybody here is probably a master of Fortran 4, so, and I am not either. Um, so we get into that. So who am I? We already went through who I am, uh, occasional beware core contributor currently at Twilio, um, and I like stuff, which is why I did this. Um, so the motivation for this, so quick background, I suppose, uh, is when you start at Twilio, it is a tradition that you sort of use Twilio to like build an app um, to sort of like as like a initiation uh, sort of thing. And so I was like, well, what I want to do is uh, I'm going to build a game some, of some sort. Um, and Twilio, for those of you that don't know, is that they generally do like voice calls and text messaging and stuff like that. And so I was like, why not write a game with text messaging as the core mechanic? Uh, and if I'm going to do that, well, the obvious, I think, like solution to that is to write a text adventure. But computer science is the science of laziness. And so I'm not going to write a text adventure. Why don't I just port an existing text adventure to Twilio or to basically SMS um, so that I can play it? Um, and so that's what I did. And uh, so I decided, well, why not do the first ever text adventure? Um, so arguably that is called Colossal Cave, or sometimes called Adventure, depending on which version you get. And when you got it originally written in 1976, the first version that you can find source code for still was in, from 1977. Um, it was extremely popular and ported to dozens of different computers all throughout the 70s and 80s. Um, like some of the terminology used in it still lives on to this day. Um, the original source code that we have was, origin was originally written for the F Fortran 4 on the PDP-10, which was a mini computer from 1966. Um, so it was kind of like a fun challenge to get this to work at all. Um, and uh, I didn't want to like, you can't actually like take Fortran 4 code and compile it these days. There's not, there's not a compiler. Like there just isn't one. And even, even if there was one, we don't have a PDP-10 to run it on anymore. I think those are all dead now. Uh, so. I sort of had a lot of fun writing a Python interpreter for the Fortran 4 code to like get it to run on modern machines and then hook it up to text um, as the way to interact with it. Um, if you want, it is up and running now. Uh, you can text uh, 1-669-238-3683. I think that spells like advent three or something. Um, but anyway, so the, like you can actually play this now. Um, you will probably melt the server if you all try it at once because this program is real inefficient. Like, <laughs> like there's so many layers of bad things going on. This, this is like, this is really just a talk of shame. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, and you know, like for you know, like echoing the keynote of this morning, uh, the code wound up being more complicated than the problem it solved. You know, it's like maybe a 700 line Fortran program. It's like a thousand line interpreter that I wrote for it. Um, but I guess that's okay because I had to write like an interpreter and then also you know emulate the PDP-10 and a whole bunch of other just like really weird things in order to get this thing to run at all. Um, so if you start up the game, it looks something like this. Uh, this is the intro from the original game. Uh, I do not actually recommend emailing or sending complaints to Will Crowther. He's a very lovely man. Uh, I think he's like a professor somewhere now or something. I'm not sure. He's still around, uh, but he probably does not care about bugs in this game anymore. It's been. <laughs> 40 years, uh, and um, I can, you know, if, I think I even have it on a terminal here where you can t like run it locally as well. Uh, by default, it will just run locally, and you know, you can ask it for instructions. It will print that. You can like wander around and go into a building, you know, enter a building, enter maybe. It's not it's not the smartest thing in the world. You can take things. You know, uh, it's like a text adventure. You know, uh, I'm not gonna play it any more than that. But like, it, it, like this does work, and this is running on the actual program I wrote, interpreting the original unmodified Fortran 4 source code. Um, so, 
PDP-10 looks something like this. It probably would fit on something about the size of this stage. If you were to have one here, it would be super loud. And you notice there's not things like a monitor you know, on it or anything like that. Like, the only way you would typically like, interact with these things is usually through like, a tape drive or a teletype machine to do like, text input and like, printing output. And that's exactly what it was meant for, which in some sense makes it work perfectly for SMS because a teletype works by like, sending like, a line of input and expecting, like, a line of, or expecting a line of input and giving you like, some lines of output. So that maps perfectly to like, sending a text message. Um, and it, you know everything was like 80 columns back then, so sending a text message, will, 80 columns will fit fine. Um, so Fortran 4 is really fun, and nothing at all like any programming language any of us have probably ever touched in the past 30 years. Uh, you know we get like all those sort of fun things that you hear about in programming, like all caps. There's no such thing as recursion, so functions can't call themselves or even like like make multiple calls like around like it's got to be a really straightforward kind of program. Uh, there are line numbers everywhere. We're going to go through some of the source code. It's a lot of fun. Spaces don't matter. You can remove every space in the, in the entire program and it will still compile. Um, and it was meant to be entered on punch cards. So I actually had to like modify the source a little bit to get it to fit on these slides and have syntax highlighting because it just like doesn't like modern syntax highlighters don't understand what to do uh, with such weirdly formatted code. Um, so, typically, every line starts with a tab. So, uh, you know, because it, you would enter the line numbers in on the leftmost side. If the first character is like a C or an asterisk, that means it's a comment. Um, and so, it sort of looks like this. It's a little weird. This is a data declaration statement. Um, like the first line just says things like, uh, you know, any any variable that I don't otherwise declare is an integer if it's a single letter, and then. Real ran is actually a really weird thing. It took me forever to find out because it's undocumented, but that actually is a function that calls, uh, that returns like a random variable. Fortran 4 doesn't have functions, interestingly enough, so this is like some really strange implicit function. Uh, and then you have like a bunch of arrays of text that is all the text in the game. Um, so, sort of like to go through and give you some more flavors on Fortran 4. Uh, it uses things like dot any dot. So this is written in time with teletypes, and teletypes didn't have all these fancy keys on them that we're used to these days, like less than or like, you know, equal and things like, well, it does have equal, but it doesn't have like, there's no, there was no equal equal, so I think it's dot eq dot is the operator you would use. Um, there's like line numbers in places. Uh, they don't have to come in any particular order, so it says, you know, go to one, and one appears like 100 lines down. Um, so that doesn't matter at all. It sets up a bunch of variables. It reads in a bunch of the arrays. Notice that when we declare the array, you can't actually give it any values. You have to do that separately as actual code. Um, it's got this like really weird, almost Python-like way to like initialize an array that like was kind of advanced for its time. Like you could give it like a little for loop almost to initialize its data. Um, so you have these, you don't really have for loops or while loops or anything like that. You just have this one thing called like do, and you would tell it what the last line is, and then it would, the compiler would remember, and then it would loop through that 300 times, and then it would eventually exit onto that line there. Um, yeah, array access sort of looks like function calls, but there were no function calls, so that's fine. <laughs> uh, not, not function calls, and I guess in the sense they're more, anyway, I will get to that. Um, whenever you read input, input is really strange. Uh, you sort of read it into a variable there. You have to give it another line number that has a format statement that tells you what kind, and G naturally stands for integer. Uh, so that's reading in <laughs> an integer. I, I looked so long to find like manuals for like this ancient version of Fortran to like try to figure all this stuff out, and eventually I just had to guess for a lot of it. Um, and I just kept like trying to run the program over and over again until I got it to finally run. This is a computed go-to statement, which is a lot of fun. So it actually like computes the last bit there, and then it uses that as an index and picks the line number to go to next based on that. So it's sort of it's sort of like a jump or switch switch jump kind of thing, but it yeah it it, it uses like a table internally. It's it's. It's really strange. This is one of my favorite ones. This one took me forever to figure out what this did. Uh, so it does, it's a read statement, so it's reading input again, um, this time from a tape drive. I think the one means read from the tape drive, of course. Uh, and 1005 scenes means read an integer, and then some number of 0A5 means ASCII strings. Uh, so <laughs> I haven't even gotten to all the fun parts yet. And then that last statement there is it will, it will read like an array of them like all in one line like that, which I think is really cool that it, you could do that so succinctly and 
like tersely. Like I, I don't understand any of that without like this is not intuitive at all. I think if you if you didn't know this Fortran four specifically, um, so you do have um, sort of subroutines that you call, I would say, but they're not like functions because they don't return a value. So how do you return a value? Like this is a function that it uses to say, you know, ask the user a question, a yes or no question, and then return in some sense the answer. Um, and this, uh, the way that works is in the actual subroutine itself, the last variable, since you passed in a variable, which is yay, it will actually assign that before it returns. And so every variable can be like in or out or both, um, which is, just weird, um, yeah. And like other than that, like this is pretty straightforward based on the things we know. You know, dot eq dot dot or dot. Uh, again, they didn't have all those fancy fancy characters on their keyboards. Uh, the line labels are actually like unique to the subroutine, so you can reuse them, which is just fun. Uh, yeah. So uh, so like some things that I haven't talked about is that like. Uh, this was on a PDP-10, and before about 1980, computers didn't really under, like, have this concept of like 8 bits or 16 bits being in a byte or in a word. Like that just, you know, they were like sort of just making it up as they went along. Uh, and the Digital Equipment Corporation, who made the PDP-10, was using a 12-bit system and then switched to a 36-bit system around the time of the PDP-10. And so all the numbers and everything that it was talking about were all 36 bits, which is really strange. And that's why earlier it was reading in five ASCII characters as a string, because that's how many would fit in 36 bits. Um, yeah, nowadays, like, we have this kind of standardized, and so we sort of take that for granted. But using these systems, things just get really weird with 12-bit and 36-bit integers and, like, 18-bit addresses and things like that. It's, uh, yeah, so I mentioned this kind of briefly. We have, a so ASCII wasn't really a thing back then. Like, it was, it was but a pipe dream. Uh, there was a version of it released in 1963, but it is not like the ASCII that you and I know and love today. Like, the control characters were just all messed up. Um, most of the letters and stuff were there, so luckily we can still read the data from that era. Uh, but, you know, this machine was designed in 1966 before, you know, most modern versions of ASCII. Um, and so you can get those sort of five uh, characters in, and you have an extra bit, which the way you do this is you sort of just like, if you have the string A, B, C, D, E, you just sort of fit it in the 36 bits and then stick an extra bit on the right. And so the Fortran 4 doesn't have like this concept of like data types like we do. So a five character string is treated as the same as an integer, and you can also use it as a floating point. Like it's all like just whatever you want, man. Like it's. <laughs> So, like, like littered in the code is it just interchangeably uses strings and integers uh, because it didn't care. Like, it was like, this is obviously only ever going to run on a Fortran 4, you know, compiler written for a 1966 machine. So, you know, we don't need to, like, anything. And here's, here's, like, some fun. Like, so maybe, you know, you think this is a text adventure. Why do I care how the integers are represented? And the reason is, is because Fortran 4 did not have, like, text processing capabilities. So it actually had to split up its own like string, so if, you know, I type in a two-word command, it's got to like find the space and like do like dot split like we would in Python. And the way it does this is with this beautiful function here. Um, I, I had to stare at this function a long time before I figured out what was going on here. Uh, but it's kind of like a work of art, uh, like how it does this. Like so, uh, just to kind of give you a quick thing to like, over like this first data line here, the, these numbers are an octal, that's what the quote means, uh, is, is it's an octal number. Uh, and those are, the bit offsets of each character in ASCII, like so the, fir the 400 is like the eighth bit, I think, or something like that, or, or whatever, whatever will be the, it'll be the shift, and since it doesn't have bit shift operations, it has to use multiplication, which you can kind of see like right here. It sort of is like shifting one character at a time, and this XOR statement is looking for a space. So if only the, you know, what is it? fifth bit is set, then that's an ASCII space character. And so it looks for a character that only has that bit set by doing a bunch of shift XORs and ANDs. Um, and then once it finds it, it'll say, like, yes, this is a two-word statement, and then it, you know, does some stuff to separate out the two words. Um, yeah, it, I could give a whole talk, maybe like a nice lightning talk, just on how this function works, and it's really awesome. Um, <laughs> and it was like a really good, like, like way to just, like, destroy my interpreter versions as I like, because like getting all of these like little bits right is almost impossible. Um, yeah, so that was, that was like a little foray into Fortran 4. Um, so then like, like my, my, 
my goal was to write a Fortran 4 interpreter in Python. Um, and so how do you do a compiler? How do you write an interpreter? Um, they sort of follow a basic formula. If you've ever taken like a compiler's course or like seen someone do a talk on it, you typically have like these four, four or five-ish uh, like formal steps of like you scan all the text into tokens that are sort of like words and you try to like construct the words into meaningful sentences or statements. Um, and then you like take that and you get like a tree that you can execute, but you want to like optimize it and tweak it and stuff. And then you can use that tree to generate code. And I thought to myself, that just sounds like way too much work. Like I'm not gonna do all that stuff. Like that's I only like this is a, like an intro project for my company. I only have a couple of days. Let's just let's just hack this. Like how hard could it be? Let's use some regular expressions or something. You know like. Um, so like my general strategy whenever I need to write something and just need to just slam it out, I mean this, this only has to work for one program ever. Like I'm not going to compile the world's Fortran 4 and all the Fortran 4 that has ever been written probably has already been written. Like there's not ever going to be another line written. So this is going to be fine. So I just do something where I just like split the lines and then I try to split the lines by white space, commas and parentheses and then I like just try to just kind of guess what statement this is going to be and then try to interpret the rest of it's real bad. Uh, don't don't ever do this like in real code, but it's fine for like a little fun project. Um, and if you're slamming together like a quick compiler, uh, named tuple is your friend. So normally you want to create like a fun class that like will contain your token and has a bunch of stuff on it. But I'm just like I don't have time to write the class statement. Like I'm just going to use name tuple. Name tuple for those of you that do not know uh, creates a class with that name that accepts those parameters and that's it. Like that's all it does. It's like a simple container and you can use it as a tuple to make it really easy to like pass it around and stuff. Uh, but so my sort of pseudo grammar is written all in named tuples. Uh, you know, an if contains an expression and a statement. You can have something called a numerical if, which has a negative, an equal to zero, and a positive uh, j like label that it will jump to. Uh, things like that. The uh, the go to, and then there was the computed go to. Um, so basically, just like a line, a named tuple for every kind of statement that can occur. And then, you know, I just sort of like load the tape drive, uh, which is just a file in our case. Uh, but it like has to simulate like in the Fortran 4 like world, like reading in from the tape drive, like the like first character device or something. Um, and then read in the code and then try to parse the lines. I didn't talk about this, but some of the lines can be split. Like if, if it's a really long line, you can put it on multiple lines and there's like a special character like column that's reserved for that. So if that's marked, then you have to combine them. So I have to parse that specially. Um, and, then, and then you just like hack it until it works. So I do a, a quick lexical analysis run where I like parse all the lines um, and then slam them all together, replace tabs with eight characters because there is the only, like otherwise nothing will make sense if you try to actually keep the tabs in. Like remove all the comments um, because we don't care about those. Uh, take out all the line, like the, the labels because we're going to have to keep track of those. Um, yeah, and then basically go through and just start executing statements after that. So uh, like it literally just takes like the output of that uh, and then execute statements. There's, there's a little bit of logic here for handling those do's because uh, while you can't recursively call anything, you can have like many do statements in a row and it can be kind of complicated to figure out exactly which do statement you're in and when it's going to return exactly because it didn't have like a return. It, it just said the next line to execute after you do this many iterations. And so you have to keep track of all of that. Um, and I do it with a simple stack. If you were actually writing a compiler for this, uh, those are all determined statically, so you wouldn't need a stack. Um, you could do it all like at compile time and know exactly how many levels you're going to be in. Uh, and then the execute statement is just a giant switch. It's just like if it's an if, execute it as an if. Like, you know, grab the expression, evaluate it as a Boolean, and run things. And then, you know, it'll check all of the other kinds of instances, uh, all of the other kinds of statements it could be, and just start executing them. Like, nothing, nothing super fancy there. Uh, you know, you have to be able to evaluate expressions. So if you need it to be a Boolean, then it does that. So, you know, it checks to see if I like threw it into a Python string or a Python integer, and then it'll just return those. Otherwise, it might be like an XOR or an equal or a not or an add and things like that. It has to do all of that com computation. Um, there's a bunch of hacks in here for like if statements are really annoying because it could have those weird numerical if statements uh, that I mentioned. So it has to like do like a quick regular expression match to grab all that because we love regular expressions. Um, 
type. Type is how you give output to the user. Um, and so it's another one of those things that has the, uh, the sort of like format argument where you tell it like what kind of thing you're going to print out. And so this just does a little quick uh, ASCII formatting of that where it you know, converts the integers into s strings and then prints them out, things like that. And there's a hack because uh, I was sloppy in how I handled arrays, and so I had to like unhack that right there. Um, that's fine. Uh, and yeah, and that's, and that's how it really works is like you just like literally just execute statements over and over again. Um, this program will run essentially forever. It doesn't really terminate uh, because it's just constantly reading user input and then outputting things and that's all it does in a big loop forever. Um, and so this is what the game sort of looks like. So like I had all that execution going on, um, but I wanted to store the state because this is going to be running on a web server or something like that where someone's going to be texting into and it's going to have to respond. So it needs to keep all of that structure. So I t take the entire interpreter state right here and I just throw it in a dictionary. <laughs> and, then I, and then I pickle it. I compress that. Oh, it's it's it's, and then I throw it, throw that whole big blob in a Postgres database, <laughs> and store it per user. And this, and like it'll, it'll like it'll stay there forever. And then like whenever you know you come back to it months later and type in like your next command, it will like pull from the Postgres database and like warm up like the program and then like dump back in the entire like interpreter state into into itself and then just pick up right where it left off. It's 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 amazing. Um, <laughs> Uh, so there's, there's three interfaces that we need uh, in order to accomplish this. We need a tape drive, which is just a file, so that's pretty easy. And we have to do a teletype input and a teletype output. Um, those could be command line again, or they could be texting. Um, so I already said we're going to use SMS, so I was going to just do a little Heroku app using Flask. Um, and it looks like this. It's only like a few dozen lines of code, if that. But like, yeah, you can literally like, it chops all any commands off the 20 characters because it can't read more than 20 characters anyway. Um, so, <laughs> yep. And then it's like, okay, just grab the state from you know from our table and then like, and then like unpickle it and throw it into a game somewhere in here. Like, uh, and then it, and it does it. Uh, time dot sleep is how you could tell this is really quality production code right here. <laughs> But it basically just like runs until like it waits a certain amount of time and doesn't see any more output, and then it decides it's done, uh, and then it'll go back to sleep. Um, and then yeah, and like it'll accept a line of input and then just keep looping forever, um, and then update the state. And literally, it's just like a 10 kilobyte blob. Like that's that's the entire database is just like phone number, 10 kilobyte blob of interpreter state, and that's just it. Um, so the background photo is from someone. Um, that is my talk. I had a lot of fun writing it. Uh, I really love these sort of sof software archaeology projects, um, you know, like looking into old code and seeing how they work and then just doing just awful, terrible, horrible hacks um, and having fun. So if you do play with the phone number, uh, feel free to. It will probably break. Uh, there's like, <laughs> if you like actually look in the code, there's like all sorts of places where I like literally just like sys.exit. I'm like, I don't even know what to do here. I hope, <laughs> I hope the code never reaches this point, and if it does, just too bad. Like, so if you, if you manage to hit one of those, congratulations. Um, yeah, that's how it is. Uh, and I did want to point out, so I think I mentioned at the very beginning I'm a Beware uh, core contributor. I think we're having a Beware breakfast tomorrow morning. Meet here at 9 o'clock out front. Uh, Beware, we can talk about it later. But, uh, but yep, that's my talk. <laughs>